Hi, it's Dr. Steve from Misericordia University, and welcome to Music Week number three as part of our course, Integrating the Arts. In this video, let's talk a little more about music and the early childhood curriculum. Let's discuss just a little bit, having looked at content songs, let's discuss a little bit about how you can use content songs in the classroom. Then let's spend the majority of our time considering musical terms and concepts. And finally, let's take a look at how could your students create musical instruments for use in your class. Let's begin this week's video by considering music and the early childhood curriculum. Music is a natural for young children. So researchers suggest that early childhood is a time to capitalize on children's interest in music, their spontaneous nature with regard to music, and to encourage their, their natural interest in singing and moving and playing with different sounds. Throughout our course, we've been exploring how the arts can uh, enhance children's experiences in the classroom. Since they're so valuable, why does music not receive deeper attention in early childhood education? Well, some researchers suggest a couple of reasons. Number one is that teachers may not recognize the value and the potential of music to provide um, children's musical development or enhance learning in different, in different areas. They may not believe that musical development is important except for the more talented children which is not true at all, because we're finding that all children have some innate musical interests and abilities. And another reason, very simply, is they don't know how. So hopefully through this course, you'll learn the whys and more of the hows as well. Further, teachers may feel intimidated because they don't have the same expertise as some people do with using music or the arts and incorporating them into the classroom. They may be, feel inhibited by their own lack of knowledge or their perceived lack of musicianship. And that's too bad because you don't have to be a great artist or a great musician to get a, a lot of benefit from incorporating the arts into your classroom. So how would you qualify a good early childhood music program that is helpful to your students? Well, some researchers suggest that you'll help the students learn how to sing tunefully, how they can move both with expression and with rhythm. They can gain experience in playing instruments in the classroom, especially rhythm instruments. They can develop age-appropriate musical concepts and understand some of the terms and, and, and how they relate to music. They can create, to a certain extent, their own music. And then they start to value music as part of their everyday life, and they can listen to music with more appreciation. We would like students who go through our classes to develop the following attitudes. I can listen I can understand music. I can write music. I can play music. I can respond to music with my body. And I can create music. A very important thing to note is that young children view music as play. It's a game. And a number of researchers have suggested this strongly. So young children approach music as a game or a playing activity. So if we continue the thought that some teachers don't feel comfortable in incorporating music and the arts into their classroom due to their own uh, perceived lack of inabilities, most educators are very comfortable with the medium of play in early childhood. So when teachers start to recognize that there's a, this playful nature within music, then music becomes a more familiar activity for them. They feel like they're on more familiar ground, and then they're more comfortable incorporating it into their class. 
going one step further, we mentioned that children view music as a as a game or a playtime. Realize one step further is that young children engage in music as an exploratory activity because it's interactive, it's social, it's very much creative, and it brings joy to them too. It's a joyful experience. But because young children view music in these ways, as a teacher, think about offering music as an activity during choice time. So when you're offering things like uh, an area for dramatic play, and, and you might have a, uh, an area where they're going to build with blocks, they can read, they can create some artwork. Why not also have a, a music center where they can where they can opt to express themselves and explore content through music? Several researchers have suggested as teachers engage students in music, which again they, they will view as play, that teachers really have about six roles in which we can engage with them. Number one, we can plan. So our first role is to set the stage, so to speak. So we're going to decide how to introduce new, new materials and, and how to engage students and draw them into the activities. We can observe how the children interact with the musical activities and with each other. And then we can find those teachable moments with them as we observe. We can participate with them. We can share and enjoy musical activities with them. Another role for teachers is to extend. In other words, we can, we can watch for those moments where we can enhance children's exploration when they're working with music uh, or, and or movement. We can, we can uh, select well-chosen open-ended questions. We can ask them, for example, how might you use this instrument a little differently? How could you be louder or softer with this particular instrument? We can interject some ideas for them. We can also model for them. In other words, we can join in in their play with music, and we can demonstrate new behaviors by, by uh, parallel play. And when adults are modeling movement to music, they can describe what they're doing. They can offer suggestions. In other words, they can now, as teachers, we can um, help students explore what are some other movements, what are some other possibilities that you can do with music. And finally, but maybe even the most important role that we can play is to motivate and encourage children to take part in the play. Now, this is particularly important when we're looking at students with different disabilities. Some students might not just spontaneously choose to get in there and to take the lead in experimenting with instruments or uh, when we're looking at movement activities. That might not be their first thought to just jump in and dive in and make that happen and, and engage in it. But as teachers, we can kind of get that going and, and, and help them and prompt them and gently get them into those activities and then uh, they'll, they'll learn, as all teachers do, that music is a very inclusive activity. But again, motivation is the start to get those students there with everyone else. So to reiterate, in this course, we want you to be effective in incorporating music as well as the, the other arts into your classroom. To do so, uh, I'm attempting to increase your experiences in using music help you become comfortable with your own musical ability. And that's why we're spending some time doing some singing and different movement activities in class itself, so you become more comfortable. And finally, to help you understand the value of music in the early childhood curriculum. Because once you're a believer that it really does work, then you're ready to start learning how to do it better. Let's say a few more words about using content songs in the classroom, and specifically piggyback songs. As a review, we had mentioned that there are three different levels at which you can incorporate music into your classroom. You can use it at the low end, so to speak, 
to set the tone and atmosphere. You could enhance educational content, which is what many teachers do, or at the high end, you can teach content through songs. So let's focus on content songs. We find that many new teachers, if they're going to incorporate music into a lesson, what they'll do is that they'll use a content song to just overview a certain concept. Now that's good, because that's one of the ways in which you can use a content song in a lesson. But further, you could do other things too. You could introduce the elements of content to be learned, and then you'll teach it and follow up with that during instruction. Uh, for example, uh, how many planets are there? Well, we could introduce the names of the planets through content song right in the beginning. And then we could follow up through instruction to explain them better and to dive into them a little more. We could look at the elements of content, such as what are the steps in the water cycle? And once they understand what the, what the steps are and can delineate them and list them, then you can go further and you can explain them through instruction. You could do so much more with content songs too. You could teach a song to serve as a memory aid. So if we're looking at, I mentioned earlier about the names of the planets. Well, it's kind of hard to memorize all the names of the planets. But if you put them in song, it serves as a memory aid and it that content will go into the learner's brain and come out so much easier and it will reduce cognitive load and anxiety. Finally, you could reinforce or review the learning of a concept through content songs as well. At our next in-person class, we're going to explore several content songs and then we're going to consider how could you incorporate them into the lesson? Could you introduce the concept? Could you introduce the elements of what, what is going to be learned? Could you teach a song to help students learn and remember something? Or could you use the song to reinforce or review a concept? And then we're going to look at some other content songs. We'll look at some piggyback songs and see how we can incorporate those uh, to support classroom management and good behaviors in the classroom. All of that we're going to do at our next in-person class. Now let's turn our focus toward understanding musical terms and musical concepts. Our first term to explore is music itself. How would you describe music? Well, when you think of it, there are many dimensions of it. On one level, we could say it's sound, but it's organized. And it consists of melody, rhythm, harmony, timbre, and expression. Now we'll take a, a closer look at each one of those terms in a moment. On another dimension, we can talk about music as a means of expressing oneself. So expression of music can involve the tone, the volume, and also the pitch, which means the high, highness or lowness of the sound. And when we're talking about expression, music can also be expressed through movement and it can inspire dance. And we've already mentioned that for young children, we find that that movement in some way is uh, in response to music that they hear is a natural response. When we look at how music is written, we find that it's written on a staff, which simply means it's kind of like a, like a graph, and it shows the highness and lowness of sound, and then depending which notes you use, it can also show the length of the sound as well. So here we have a G clef or a treble clef, and if we were to look at those different notes, the, the lines and the spaces, we find that they are E, and then we skip F, and we go to G, and then you'll notice B, D, and F. So really, the musical alphabet is A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And if we look at the starting uh, point on the treble clef, E is the very start, and after we hit G, then we go back to A. 
Uh, how would you help students remember that? Well, you might have learned a sentence like every good boy does fine, or in our modern world, uh, we could be more gender, gender neutral and say every good bird does fly. And then the spaces spell F-A-C-E, so then that forms a good mnemonic there in order to, to remember those particular parts of the treble clef. The next term, which is a very important term in music, is melody. So melody is just the succession of musical pitches that are arranged in rhythm. In other words, it's the tune of the song. It's the, it's the part that we sing. So when you're singing part of a song, the part you're singing is the melody. If you look at it as written music, we find that's the linear. In other words, the part that's going from left to right, going across on the staff. Now think about how would you describe a melody to a child? We'll discuss that more in our uh, next in-person class. Let's differentiate between the word rhythm and beat. When we talk about rhythm, we're talking about the position of musical activities, different musical events, in time. In other words, when do you hear them? So when you hear individual notes, how long do they last? When do they start? That's all part of rhythm. When we're talking about the beat of a song, we're talking about the rhythmic pulse, or like the, like the accenting of sounds, that you just naturally feel and that you naturally hear when you're listening to music. So, for example, when you hear music, and we said it's so natural to respond by some type of movement, like clapping your hand or stomping your foot. That stomping or that, that clapping is going to be the beat. So if we were to sing, she'll be coming around the mountain, she'll be coming around the mountain when she comes, there you can hear the beat. Notice that that beat, that rhythmic pulse, keeps going, even though individual notes happen at different times and at different lengths but that rhythmic pulse, the beat, is very steady. Another important musical term is tempo. And tempo simply refers to the speed in which music is being played. Is it fast or is it slow? Now, when you're working with very young children, how can you help them articulate that? Well, one way would be to give them a sheet in which you had a slower animal, like a turtle drawn, and a faster animal, like a rabbit drawn, and then they could circle the appropriate animal when they hear the music being played. Now, when you're teaching rhythm, beat, and tempo, you could have your students, you could play music and have them sway to the music. So if they're swaying, it's kind of like a very gentle movement, so not like a true dance. And they could still find that they're swaying differently according to the differences in rhythm, beat, and tempo. You could play a familiar song and have them clap. You could have them conduct as if they were a conductor of an orchestra. You could give them a percussion instrument and have them play as you conduct. We'll experiment with this at our next in-person class. When we talk about pitch, we're talking about the highness or the lowness of a sound. Now, also, we find that a girl's voice may be higher in pitch than a boy's voice, although at very young ages, sometimes the boy's voices are actually a little higher than the girl's at that time. But in time, that changes. We find that instruments, that the larger the instrument, it tends to play lower sounds. So if you consider an instrument like a tuba that's very large, it plays a very low pitch. And then we find that a flute, which is much smaller, it plays a much higher sound. So we say it plays a higher pitch. And if you look at even a smaller instrument, like a piccolo, that's a really little, little tiny flute. It's smaller and it plays even higher pitch. When we look at the piano, the keys of a piano uh, on the lower part of the piano, we find that it plays the low pitches. The further that you go to the right, the higher the pitches are. And if you look inside of a piano, you find that the size and the 
girth of the strings on the left hand side of the piano they're very long and they're coiled they have coils of wire around them and they play that deep sound as you move to the right when you get to the highest keys on the piano they're barely an inch or two long so they're very very short harmony is a term that refers to playing at the same time more than one sound so when you hear several vocalists singing at the same time they're usually seeing as long as they're singing different notes we say that they're singing in harmony when you look at written music this would be uh, harmony would be the notes on top of each other indicating that they're sounding at the same time when we refer to tone we're talking about what you might describe as like the color the coloring of music and we'll explore this in our in-person class some music is written in a major key and in our country we normally perceive that as being bright and happy and other music is written in a minor key and in this country we view that as generally like dark or sad now realize that's a cultural thing because while major and minor exist in all different cultures in some cultures playing in the minor key in that tone is considered the norm and it doesn't sound sad to those folks at all again we'll explore that better in our, at our next in-person class one last musical term for now and that's timbre now realize it looks like it's might be pronounced timber but that refers to lumber so that's not this term at all timbre refers to the character or the quality of sound that allows you to distinguish one instrument or even one voice from another voice so for example if you were to listen to a trumpet and you were to listen to a flute they're two entirely different sounds so that's what we're referring to the type of sound when we talk about the timbre of an instrument now one thing that we did not look at yet here we didn't look at how to incorporate all of these different elements or aspects of music into expression and expressiveness so we'll get there but for now those are the musical terms that help us describe and define music at our next in-person class we're going to explore the world of virtual musical instruments and then we're also going to explore how to use these instruments in teaching elements of music to your students as we're helping our students to explore use of different musical instruments it's also important to help them learn to use their own voice so we can ask young children to experiment with these types of sounds we can say a loud sound a soft sound something that's fast something that's slow and different sound effects like animal sounds like barks and purring clucking and also sounds that people make like snoring or crying coughing or even sneezing so what musical elements can we explore through this type of activity loud and soft we're talking about the dynamics of the sound when we talk about fast and slow we're talking about tempo in helping students to learn to use their own voice there are many songs that you can incorporate in your classroom to help students make animal sounds songs like old MacDonald had a farm or if you're happy and you know it you can do different types of sounds on in that song as well we'll explore several of these songs at our next in-person class and finally as we're exploring instruments and sounds and also animal sounds and how the voice works we can also incorporate movement into these activities as well we can have students act like different animals what kinds of sounds do they make what kind of movement do they do because when we look at it they're very much related the movement can be could be uh, intense 
it could be fast, it could be slow, it could be light in intensity. So basically, between the sounds and the movement, we can help our students experience and understand better the concepts of pitch, rhythm, timbre, and also expression. Let's now turn our focus to musical instruments, especially the types of instruments that would be very appropriate to use with early childhood learners. As children are learning about music, they should be exposed to many different types of musical experiences, including music from different types of musical instruments. Instruments of all kinds have value in the musical environment of young children. The first instrument sounds that a young child hears and also experiments with are percussion instruments. Can you name any of these types of instruments that children typically will experiment with at home? You probably experimented with these yourself. Pots and pans would, would be like drums, spoons for castanets, maybe several measuring spoons made out of metal that would function similar to a tambourine, or two wooden spoons that could function like rhythm sticks. And of course, the all-time favorite is lids or metal pie pans that can function like cymbals. When we're looking at our youngest children, percussion instruments are the ones that are most widely used in early childhood education and very appropriately. Notice that other than the few instruments listed here in the right-hand column, where you can actually hear some melodies like the xylophone, the glockenspiel, any type of chime or bell, and of course the piano, they all play melodies but all the rest of the instruments listed here, uh, you do not have to have any special training in order to get the rhythm and the sound out of these instruments, and no melody is involved. As children grow older, it's good to introduce them to more of the families of instruments from the orchestra. Overall, we classify instruments in the orchestra in four different families. Percussion is the first family that we already discussed. We also have wind instruments. So wind instruments are anything that you blow into, like a flute or an oboe or a clarinet, saxophone, bassoon, and they're not made out of brass. And then we've got the brass instruments, and they're easy to recognize because of their color. Uh, trumpet in any form, trombones, French horn, or the large tuba. And the fourth family of instruments in the orchestra are the string instruments. Again, very easy to distinguish these from all of the other instruments. And we could classify the string instruments as bowed instruments. In other words, a player has to take a bow and draw it across the strings. For example, with the violin, the viola, which is a little bit larger, the cello, and the double bass, which is the largest of the string instruments. And you can also pluck them. So the guitar, the mandolin, the ukulele, the harp, and also the banjo. At our next in-person class, we will explore how you can introduce the different families of instruments to your students. But before we finish this topic, consider this quote from two researchers. And they say that just like with language, you would not deprive young children of hearing all forms of language, even if they're not able to speak those words and use those syntax of language just at that time, it's a little too early for them. Likewise, these researchers suggest that you would not want to deprive young children of hearing different types of instruments just because they're not able to, to use them and to play, play them or to fully appreciate them just at this time. 
with music as in language, it's strongly suggested that we do not deprive our children, but rather give them a picture of all the different possibilities that are out there. As we draw toward the end of this video, let's look at one other topic, the creation or the making of musical instruments in the classroom. Young children enjoy the activity of making their own musical instruments and then playing those instruments. And they can make instruments from all kinds of common materials, like paper towel rolls, you know, when the paper is depleted from it, aluminum pie plates, paper plates, different sizes and types of boxes, even ice cream cartons, bottle caps, spools, wooden blocks, embroidery hoops, basically anything that's around the house can be used in some form to create some type of sound. Having your students create and play their own musical instruments is a really valuable educational activity. When students get to make an instrument and then they play it, it helps them further experience self-expression and they can see how musical instruments and music can allow them to do so. It helps them understand better how sounds can be made from natural materials in the environment. And depending the types of activities you combine with the musical instruments, you can also include language, art, science, math, social studies, and also sensory learning opportunities. So what type of simple percussion instruments could your students make? Well, a natural would be a drum. A drum could be made from any kind of a container. It could be a, a large ice cream carton, a box, um, some type of bowls sometimes with something stretched over the top of them. Um, very easy to create. And then you could make drumsticks out of things like pencils and possibly covered with felt so you don't damage the, the instrument or make it too loud. A tambourine is easy to make. You could make that from aluminum pipe plates. You could even make it with paper plates. You could tie something on the outside like bells, or you could put uh, bottle caps. Uh, you could do something so that when you shake it, you can, you can hear the, uh, these per the percussive nature of all of those extra elements that you tie on to it. An instrument used in the orchestra sometimes is a sandpaper block. That would be very easy to create. Just get some sandpaper and glue it to two wooden blocks and then rub them together. You could also make shakers of any kind. You could make them with paper plates that are sealed together. You could use a plastic bottle like from milk or from, from some beverage like a, a water or even a box, and then put something in there to allow the shaking to take place. You could put small rocks, dried beans, or bird seed. If your students wanted to explore a more involved instrument, they could try creating a shoebox guitar. So take a box and then create about a two inch round hole uh, in, in the box. And then you can stretch rubber bands around the box. If you place a pencil under the rubber bands on one side of it, that will allow the pitch to be changed and for the rubber bands to, to percuss, for them to vibrate and make better sound. You could also have them create a flute. A flute could be made from any type of a cardboard tube. If you place a little bit of waxed paper over the one end and just use a rubber band to tighten it on, and if you cut several holes in a row, then the students can put their fingers over those holes like a flutist would, would use. And also, if you use the wax paper, the sound that you would create would be like a kazoo, which is a wonderful instrument for early childhood. Another place you can look 
for many good ideas is a website like Pinterest. You'll find wonderful ideas out there and they'll be creative and they'll be fun for the students and allow for self-expression and further you can incorporate, which is the important thing, different content into and, and this instrument uh, into teaching that content. So as a quick review, in this video, we started by considering music and its use in the early childhood curriculum, including roles that the teacher plays in introducing music into the class. We looked a little bit about how to use content songs in the classroom. We spent the majority of our time considering musical terms and concepts and how to teach them to our students. And finally, we looked at different musical instruments and how your students could create musical instruments for use in your class. At our next in-person class, let's consider how we can use piggyback songs to support classroom management. Let's explore how to help students experience and understand some of those elements and concepts of music that we looked at in today's video. And finally, let's spend some time exploring virtual instruments, both through apps and also online sources. See you at our next class.